In the previous discussion on reflection coefficient, we have assumed that the incident ultrasound beam approaches the soft tissue interface at a perpendicular angle. What happens if the angle of incidence is non-perpendicular? Here we depict the ultrasound beam coming in at an angle and hits the interface between two adjacent soft tissues. As you expect, the incident beam will break off into a reflected beam, which in this case is depicted as a dotted arrow bouncing off the interface at an angle of theta r, which is the same as the incident angle. Next, you see the transmitted beam, which is in effect bent away from the incident beam and form the transmitted beam. Again, we have the reflected beam and the, and the transmitted beam's amplitude adding up to 1 to be equivalent to the incident beam. However, we have an additional uh, differences uh, in angles that we didn't see in the previous example. Namely, that theta t is not the same as theta i. Snell's law describes this phenomenon which is refraction. Basically, the equation states that the sine of the transmitted angle, theta t, over the sine of the incident angle, theta i, equals c2 over c1, where c2 is the speed of sound in the transmitted medium, over c1, which is the speed of sound of the, uh, the reflected or the initial medium in which the ultrasound beam approaches. Let's do a question to review what we learned about Snell's law. The question asks, Snell's law predicts what? You should now have the equation in your mind. And here are the four choices. A. Does Snell's law predict the direction of the reflected ultrasound beam? B. The direction of the transmitted beam? C. The amplitude of the reflected beam? Or D. The amplitude of the transmitted beam? the correct choice. If you have the equation in mind, this should be a fairly straightforward question to answer. The angles in question are theta t and theta i, and therefore we're not dealing with magnitude as much as angles. Therefore the answer is b, direction of the transmitted beam. Recall sine of theta t over sine of theta i can be determined by the ratio of the speed of sounds of the two medium. Let's summarize what we have learned thus far about the reflection and refraction of sound waves. As long as acoustic matching between two materials at the interface is good, we expect that the reflection coefficient r between soft tissue, soft tissue interfaces to be less than 2%, for fat and soft tissue interfaces, we expect that number to be well less than 10%. On the other hand, to account for refraction, we know from Snell's law that if the soft tissue to soft tissue acoustic matching is good, the transmitted beam angle change or the bending of the beam will be small. Note that Refraction is a very important concept because it can cause misregistration of an object during ultrasound measurements. The table below summarizes the ratios of the refraction, namely of the reflection, namely reflection uh, values across the different interfaces. Let's talk about the differences between specular and diffuse reflectors. In the diagram for specular reflection, the surface is very smooth. As the incoming beam hits the interface, you get a, a singular beam that is reflected at the same angle as the incidence angle. Specular reflection is responsible for the bright appearance of fiber structures such as diaphragm, bladder wall, and tendons. On the other hand, diffuse reflectors have a characteristic echo pattern that appears to be speckled yet homogeneous. This is due to the fact 
that the specular reflectors, the diffuse reflectors, tend to be rough. As the incoming beam gets scattered, they go in many different directions, albeit at a much smaller amplitude. Examples of diffuse reflectors include the kidney and the liver, because they both consist of many acoustic scatterers, which we'll discuss in the next slide. Other examples include uh, the walls of the heart chamber, small blood vessels, and other similar structures in which the surfaces or the of the interfaces are not smooth. Note that even though diffuse reflectors have um, a very weak echo signals, in general they are, the image quality is insensitive to the orientation of the reflector compared to the echo from a smooth specular reflection. Therefore, an example uh, such as the liver will always give a very homogeneous yet speckled picture regardless of what angle you're holding the ultrasound probe against the patient's body. Acoustic scatterers are components inside diffuse reflectors that make diffuse reflection possible. Acoustic scattering describes reflections from small objects that are the size of the wavelength of the ultrasound beam or smaller. So if the wavelength of an ultrasound beam is 0.5 millimeters, these acoustic scatterers have dimensions much smaller than this. An example of a diffuse reflector that consists of many, many acoustic scatterers is the liver. You see in uh, the next slide that the liver parenchyma have the typical diffuse scattering uh, image quality to them. This is because the liver or other similar solid organs have a very high volume of acoustic scatterers which contribute to the rather hyperechoic quality to the ultrasound image. Furthermore, acoustic scattering is relatively insensitive to the ultrasound beam angle. This leads to a relatively homogeneous texture in the resulting image. As we mentioned earlier, Diffuse reflectors consist of many such acoustic scatterers that make this homogeneous texture possible. In the case of a uh, liver scan, uh, as shown in the next slide, on the leading edge of this image you have liver. You can imagine that there are many, many uh, acoustic scatterers embedded in the liver which contribute to the speckled yet rather homogeneous texture of the liver. On the other hand, if you look at the fibrous sheath that uh, is present in the Morrison pouch, this very bright specular reflector comes and goes, depends on the beam angle. However, the kidney itself as you can see, the calyces and the parenchyma of the kidney have a rather uniform look uh, to it, irrespective of the beam angle. This speckled uh, yet homogeneous pattern is again due to the reflection of the diffuse scatterers, which contribute to the alternating hyperechoic and hypoechoic, hyper and hypoechoic quality to the resulting image. Let's talk about Rayleigh scattering. It is an example of acoustic scattering, specifically referring to the usage of red blood cells and the scattering of ultras ultrasound signals and being utilized within the context of a Doppler color flow imaging study. Similar to the diffuse scattering mechanism, we depend on the, uh, the fact that the dimensions of red blood cells are much smaller than the ultrasound wavelength. Unlike depth attenuation and um, specular reflection, Rayleigh scattering increases frequency. The dependence is actually frequency to the fourth power. This example is a, uh, uh, an image from the uh, color Doppler, power Doppler measurement of a, an upper extremity vein it demonstrates the utility 
of using red blood cells and the phenomenon of really scattering uh, for a very useful purpose.